Yesterday I got to sit down with my friend Marcos over at Equisys and we talked about uh, a little bit about the visa process and the different types of visas that you can get. As part two of this video, <clears throat> I also shared questions with him that you guys submitted after last week's video about the end of life documentation. So stay tuned for part two. As soon as I come back, we'll get started. Hey! Hello there. Okay, thanks so much, Marcus, for seeing me again. This is time. This last week we talked about uh, getting the end of life documentation together. That was a very important topic. We got some good reviews on it, a lot of good questions. And at the end of this discussion today, I'm going to ask you some questions that some viewers asked, and mm -hmm. uh, and hope that. And it's not too many. I think there's like four or five questions, three or four questions. Okay, I'll ask those, and then. Uh, but for today, we're going to be talking about the visa, mm -hmm. all right? So I, while I was waiting for you to finish up some business, I, I actually sat down here and wrote down 10 questions that just came to my mind. They're probably pretty common questions that you probably hear a lot. And feel free to expand on any of this that you want to. So my first question is, what are the most popular visas that people get when they come here? Okay, the most popular visas... First, we have the pensioner's visa, the pensionado visa, and then we have the professional visa and the investor visa. Okay. Investor mostly in certificate of deposit in Ecuador. But with the new changes in the law since February 18 of 2022, we have the new digital nomad visa, and a lot of people are, are asking for this type of visa. Yeah, are you really? Are you getting a lot of people? Or well, we have some inquiries from yeah. people asking for the digital nomad visa. Yeah, yeah. It's a, um, it's a, it's a project from the government. They are trying to promote Ecuador as a destination for people to come here, but at the same time, to enjoy what Ecuador has to offer. Sure, and they can work, work from home, mm -hmm. and that, that's what that visa is what gives them that right to do that. Mm -hmm. Right? Is that okay? Kind of, I, I knew it's, I was, I kind of knew what it was about, but yeah. I wasn't real sure. Does your uh, your price that you charge for doing all this work for them does that actually include the government fee for the visa? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. actually, how on the way how we work is we send an estimate after we have a an, an initial conversation with a client, mm -hmm. so we we know exactly what the case is about. Okay. But we send an estimate and everything will be included. The translations, the government fees, any extra document will be included in our estimate. Okay. And something that is important, I always say this to our clients, it might sound obvious, but we honor our estimates. I have seen the practice from other business that they provide the service, and at the very end, they will ask you for more money. So once we sign an estimate, that's the total amount that you will end up paying. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. How long does it take to get a visa? What's, okay. the, what's the average time? Well, um, we have two stages. We have the first part, which is obtaining the documents in your home country, and this normally for people in the U.S., it takes two months and a half. For people in Canada, it takes around two months. Once you have all the paperwork and once we are applying here in Ecuador, the visa process takes between four to six weeks. But you have to take in consideration two things. There are some visa office that they will, they will have an expedite processing of their visa. So mm -hmm. you can get your visa approved within 48 hours. But there are, this is only when they don't have a big load of work. But if they have more work, those four to six weeks, it will take a little bit longer. But it depends on how many people are applying for the visa at that time. Okay, all right. I, I would imagine that people with a, a family. I mean, of course, you know, I came here by myself and my process was pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. And 
it went without. I, I, it seemed to me like it took longer to get all my part done mm -hmm. in the states than it did to actually get the visa here. Is it true that expats are not allowed to do their own interpretation, the, Span the English to Spanish translation? Mm -hmm. Is that true? I've, I've been told that you're not allowed to do that yes. because of a conflict of interest? Yes, that, that's the main reason. You are not allowed to do your own translations because of conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. um, there are some offices, like for example in Cuenca, they require you to have an interpreter that is legally authorized by the judiciary system of Ecuador. There are other offices where you just can have a, a translator that can make this translation before a notary, and that will be completely valid for okay. the process. All right. I've had people, do-it-yourselfers, say that they're going to do it, and I always tell them, I say, well, yeah. you're going to run into a little snag here, yeah. okay? Yeah. So, okay. The next question I have, if an expat wanted to get their visa without an attorney or a facilitator, is that okay? Can they do that? I always say this. We provide a service yeah. like going to a restaurant. Mm -hmm. You can go to a restaurant, you don't have to buy your food, cook, serve, and then do Clean your up. dishes. Yes. Yeah. So, of course, the, the process you can do it yourself, but there are some technicalities that with, with a person with experience will be telling you because the law is four or five requirements but the law doesn't explain you how to get those documents just to give you an example if your criminal background check it has a different name of what your passport what your name appears in your passport that's a complete different person we just have a case of a client that it was a T missing in his passport, so he has to renew, uh, he has to get a new passport with his last name fixed. But this delays everything because uh, he's running out of his days in Ecuador and he might have to pay the fine. So you can do it yourself, but... A mistake can be very costly. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's good advice. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I, I certainly don't advocate that people do it themselves. Mm -hmm. I, I tell people, if you're going to invest in a trip to another country, yes. the most important expense is going to be getting that legal team together to get your, doc, cross your T's and dot your I's, and get everything done right. So what insurance is required for a visa? Is there insurance required? Oh, yeah. Health insurance? Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, actually, yes, it is. Uh, uh, with the new changes in the law since February 18 of 2022, there is a requirement to get an insurance uh, along with your application. Okay. Now, once you get your visa, are you still required to have that insurance? Or? Okay. By law, you are required to have an insurance during the length of your visa in Ecuador. Okay. That's what the law says. Okay. And here's something that uh, it, is, it is common. We, we receive this question very often. Because as a result of receiving your visa, you will be getting your cedula. Yeah. But when you are applying for the first time for your visa, you don't have a cedula. Right. So you need to get a private health insurance. Only after you get your visa and your settle, you can go for the public health insurance. ISS. ISS. Got it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. That clears that up because there was a lot of confusion on my channel and some discussions that I've had with people about that. And there mm. were, I mean, the rules were different when I applied because that was before mm -hmm. the new year. Yeah. So uh, rules change a lot. Yes, don't a they? lot. <laughs> <laughs> So how soon after getting the visa can you get your schedule? How long do you have to wait? Okay, well, once you receive your, your visa, we advise, or on the way how we work, is we get the schedule order. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Cedula order is a document that is issued by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or the Visa Office that basically what it says is uh, it's a letter for the Civil Register of Ecuador saying this person obtained its visa and now can go to the Civil Register to get its cedula. Okay. This document is valid only for 20 days. So once you receive your cedula order, you only have 20 days to go and get your cedula. Okay. If you don't go within these 20 days, you have to get another cedula order and you will get another 20 days to go and get your, and make your appointment or go to the civil register to get your cedula. Mm -hmm. What happens if somebody comes here and they don't get a visa and they stay here for a year or two years? What happens when they try to leave? Yeah. Do they get in trouble? Yeah. What normally happens is when you are leaving, they will verify in your passport that you overstayed. Mm -hmm. If you overstayed, no matter if it's one day, two days, three months, one year, you will be receiving a fine. You will be receiving a document that it says that you will have to pay the fine. If I'm not wrong, for right now, it is $215. And you can choose whether if you pay or not. Mm -hmm. It's not like you will be restricted to leave if you don't pay the fine. Okay. You must pay the fine if you want to come back to Ecuador within a year okay. after your departure date. Okay. If you want to come back within a year, then you will have to pay the fine and get a visa at Ecuadorian consulate outside of Ecuador. That will be the only, the only reason why you have to pay the fine. Okay. One question that I get a lot of people ask mm -hmm. when they got an FBI report that's got mm -hmm. a lot of stuff on it, when are people required to go in for an interview? And is that the reason why they go in for an interview? Because of their FBI report? Yeah, yeah, that's... Okay, if you have a criminal history, if you have a background in your FBI background check, mm -hmm you will be called to go for an interview, no matter what. You always will be called to go for an interview okay. before the visa office. Then the purpose of this is, I have been in this meeting several times and, the and they, they, they will be asking you under what circumstances happened and uh, how old were you, uh, did you hire an attorney to, to do this? Did you plead guilty? And if it's a DUI, they will be asking under what circumstances mm -hmm. in general. Yeah. And most of the cases, you have to make an affidavit and you have to explain everything that happened and for, with the criminal background check. But... If it is something that is more serious, where uh, people that committed have committed crimes and they serve jail time for more than three years, mm -hmm. in these cases, you will not be getting a visa to Ecuador. Oh, that's so true. under the law, for criminal cases that you were found guilty, that the the jail time is more than three years, you will not be eligible to get a visa. So if John Doe comes here and he hires Equises to get his visa for him and he gets called in for the interview, do you go with him? Well, most of the time, yes. Okay. Right. Uh, but you have to take in consideration that they want to see who are they interviewing at the visa office. Okay. We instruct our clients on most of the questions they are going to be receiving. And I mean, receiving the assurance from, from us that this is not something that they're, they are going to be sending you to jail. They're, they're just, they just want to know under what circumstances it happens, this situation. Okay. And it's just like keeping yourself cool, um, explaining straightforward what happened and the supportive document will be an affidavit, and then you will be okay. okay. If we have the chance, I'm sorry, if we have the chance to answer with our clients, we will go with them, but most of the cases they want to speak with the client by themselves. We have to remember, this is not 
a, um, a formal accusation, accusation from the government. Mm -hmm. They just want to know what happened okay. and on that date. Well, sometimes it's, it's just comfortable to know that you got your attorney with you just in case yeah. they ask you a question and you're not sure how to answer it, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so I've talked to some guys that have had several DUIs. Mm -hmm. Don't ask me how I know these people. I just, mm -hmm. just happened to run across them, and they always ask, you know, if I go in for an interview, am I going to be denied? And, and now I can see uh, why there would be some concern about that. You well, know, especially if there's jail time involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, okay. th there there are some considerations that uh, I had a I have an interview with with one of the authorities from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. They look at into different things. If it's something that is isolated, mm -hmm. uh, they say, okay, well, yeah, this person, I mean, it was mm -hmm. a one-time mistake. But if this is repetitive, yeah. and they they have the right to say this person is a threat for the country for the country and they can deny but it is we, we will be preparing our clients to to go for that interview sure in regards to the investor visa mm -hmm. okay we, when i came here I, I came here with the intent of getting an investor's visa because i wanted to buy cds mm -hmm. but then my attorney that i had helping me with my visa, this was before I met you, mm -hmm. uh, you know, advised me that if I wasn't going to buy a property or anything, I didn't, really didn't have to have an mm -hmm. investor's visa. I could come in on my pensioner's visa mm -hmm. because I qualified for that mm -hmm. without any problem and I could still buy CDs. So clarify that for me. Is it still that way? I mean, do you, what's required to have an investor's visa? Mm -hmm. What's, in court? What's required for that? Okay, well, the minimum investment in Ecuador is a 100 minimum wages. For 2022, that will be $42,500. Okay. And you can, you have basically four options. You can buy shares in an Ecuadorian company. You can buy real estate in Ecuador. You can buy a certificate of deposit in an Ecuadorian bank. Or you can buy bonds uh, from... from from the government or from a company and investment. So that will be a lot that will allow you to get the investor visa. Okay. If you have, let's say, a college diploma, a pension, or any other type of income where you become eligible to apply for any other category of visas, there is no need for you to invest and commit those funds in a CD for your visa okay. because the minimum requirement for you to have your money at the bank is 720 days. So that money will be locked into the bank for the length of your visa. Okay. Rather, if you have your a pensioner's visa, you can, you can withdraw the, the funds or you can have an investment for six months you still can buy a certificate of deposit, but okay. this can be for three months, six months, and you don't need to be committed for 720 days. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. That's a good question and a good answer. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, when are you required to file for the extension? Let, let's talk about the extension, because that's there's a lot of confusion about okay. that, too. Good, good, perfect. Because first, I will have to explain um, how many days you receive when you arrive mm -hmm. to Ecuador. Let's say you are coming from the U.S. or Canada or Europe. When you first arrive to Ecuador, you will be receiving a stamp for 90 days. Okay. These 90 days on the way, how they, they will be uh, accounting is, for example, you arrive today um, October 14 of 2022 you have one year to use those 90 days. So for example, in your first trip, you come to visit for 15 days. Mm -hmm. So that means that for your next trip, you will have a remaining of 75 days that you can use it until October 14 of 2023. Mm -hmm. So every time you come, those days, it will be deducted out of your 90 days. Mm -hmm. So on your second trip, let's say you come for 30 more days. 
So on your next trip, you will have 45 days left that you can left, use. Okay, of course. It. Okay. There is a big difference because our clients, they get some of them, they get confused because our other countries like Panama or Costa Rica, that every time you leave and you re-enter, you are getting another 90 days. Ecuador is not the case yeah. for that. So to answer your question about when is the time to apply for an extension, you only can apply for an extension when your 90 days, when your first 90 days are due. Okay. Because there is a problem in the system of migration that they don't accept extension applications until you don't have remaining days. Well, yeah. So you have to apply on day 20, uh, 91st mm -hmm. for you to get a 90 day extension okay. or let's say you didn't apply right away so you apply 10 days after the the, the expiration of your first 90 days mm -hmm. so you will be receiving you will not be receiving 90 days you will be receiving 80 days because that's the remaining time that will allow you to stay here in Ecuador okay all right that's a little confusing, but it's, yeah. you know, that's why we have people yes. like you, you know. Is there anything else that you want to add about the visa process that I didn't cover here that you think of? Yeah, well, uh, all documents, they must come with the apostille. Yeah. That's, that's a must. Apostille, uh, some people, they are familiar with it. Um, most of our clients, they're not relocating to a new country all the time. Mm -hmm. But apostille is a seal that makes a national document valid internationally. Okay. So, for example, the U.S., United States, they, they are part of the Hague Convention. Yeah. So, once they, it has the document, it has the apostille, then it can be accepted here in Ecuador. Okay. Different happens with Canada because Canada is not part of the Hague Convention. So... Mm -hmm. Canadians documents they cannot get the apostille so the process for them will be first going to global affairs and then going to the Ecuadorian consulate to get legalized so that will be the something that I completely I, I, different yeah yes. from mm -hmm. US but I will advise clients to pay attention on that yeah. because it is very very important and also time is of the essence too right yes. I mean like the FBI reports only good for 90 days is that 90 days from the time they request the, mm -hmm. the report? Okay. Yeah, uh, let, me, let me answer that. Okay. The answer for that is six months. Okay. All documents are valid only for six months. In the case of the FBI background check, mm -hmm. you start counting. Since the issuance date of the document, six months until your last entry to Ecuador before the application of your visa. Okay. So if you get your document today in October, we have November, December, until April 14, 15 to enter Ecuador. Yeah. And then you can use that document. Okay. If you enter Ecuador after six months of the issuance date of your FBI background check, okay. then the document will not be valid anymore. And also, yeah, I think it's important to note that the name has to be exactly right. Yeah, the, the, the name has to match with the your name and your passport. Or, yeah. all, all, all the name, because your travel document is yeah. your passport. Yeah. So, all documents, well, the visa will be issued in the, in the passport. So all documents, all supporting documents, they must match with your name and your passport. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. Okay. Okay, I think that pretty well covers it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know there's a lot more. Yes. It, the best thing to do is to get in touch with you and mm -hmm. just, you know, what do you, do you recommend, I tell people, get all your apostille documentation all together before you come here. Yes. You know, do you agree with that or? Absolutely, you know? yeah. 100%. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Uh, for example, on the way how we work with our clients, so we get in touch like probably six months before with mm -hmm. them. And we guide them 
on how to obtain their documents in the in the US or Canada. Mm -hmm. We send weekly updates to our clients and we tell we give the, the instructions. Okay, uh, you have to send your documents to this office, you have to uh, send it with a prepaid envelope and a money order and they will expect to receive their documents and once they receive it they scan them to us and we verify okay everything is okay we will start making the translations here in Ecuador okay. and whenever they come with the originals we are ready to apply for them with the translations uh, they will be ready okay. different story is when and this this is happening a lot lately that people come here and they come to the office and basically they want to pay the fee mm -hmm. uh, expecting us to have a visa ready for them <laughs> but yeah. that's that's yeah. not I the know case. some of those people <laughs> <laughs> that's not the case mm -hmm. so then uh, we will have to take the fingerprints yeah. we take the fingerprints here in our office and uh, we send this to our satellite office in Florida mm -hmm. and we process all the apostille from Ecuador. Oh, okay. It's more expensive because as Equises, we have to pay Florida wages. Sure. So it will increase DHL. We all always use premium uh, mailing because we don't want to lose. Yeah. The, those documents are so important. But if you do this in the US, it will cost probably 10% uh, of what you mm -hmm. will be paying here in Ecuador okay. to get yeah. those documents. Okay, I think we've pretty well covered it. I, I, we know that there's a lot more. And everybody in my channel knows if they have questions, they're certainly free to write. Speaking of questions, we have some from last week, okay? Yes. From the end of the I like questions. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm excited, these, yeah. Some of these are really good, too. Yes, yes. Um, I, I'm not going to mention the names of these people other than their first name, okay? Some of these people I know. Uh, but... They're good questions. So the first one, this now this is all in regards to end of life documentation that we covered last week. The first question is from Kathy. She said, I have a couple additional questions. However, if I have an Ecuadorian will, does my beneficiary have to be in Ecuador or can or come to Ecuador? Say she 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 has a will here and something happens to her, you know, that does does the beneficiary have to actually come to Ecuador to mm -hmm. take advantage of what's been left? Okay, well, for them? Uh, here we have two options. The beneficiary mm -hmm. can come to Ecuador and go through the effective position process okay. itself. The effective position is like the probate process in the U.S. So the person comes to Ecuador, go to a local notary, take position over the assets of the deceased person, okay. and get registered to this to the register of properties and that person will start having ownership rights over the assets okay right. first option second option is if the beneficiary cannot come to ecuador mm -hmm. can nominate a power of attorney a representative okay. so the the representative here in ecuador can sign all the documents on behalf of the beneficiary that can be in the U.S., Canada, or any other part of the world. So now she's saying uh, executor. Is that the same thing you're talking about? Um, executor is yeah. the person that administers the will. Yes, or something like that? that's I'm the executor. Sure. Yeah. The executor is the person that is appointed to follow all the instructions. Okay. Of whatever instruction the will has. Yeah. And the, the beneficiary is, of course, the beneficiary, but the power of attorney person is a third party person that is going to be representing the beneficiary for any signing of the documents here in Ecuador. Okay. She went on to say, can I appoint an Ecuadorian executor to liquidate these things and send the proceeds to my beneficiary? Yeah, that's a good question. Okay. Uh, the executor can be someone that is in Ecuador. Okay. Uh, not necessarily has to be Ecuadorian. Can be a, a foreigner, can be, can be any person mm -hmm. that has a, um, a visa here in Ecuador. That's, that's a must. Mm -hmm. But it can be any person who is here in Ecuador. Yeah. She said, I will be there alone with two pups. Uh, with two pups. I don't have my glasses, so I'm having a hard time. 
I would be most comfortable with the Ecuador, with an Ecuadorian attorney as my executor, at least at this point. That's what she she just making mm -hmm. a point there. Yeah. Her next question was, at what point do I need to get these documents? Talking about the the end of life documentation together. It, uh, she said, do I have to have a cedula or a certain visa first? Um, I think no. that's a great question. Yeah, you know? it is a really yeah. good question because there are some 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 people, some investors that they come here and they purchase real estate with a tourist visa. Mm -hmm. They don't have a cedula, but they still can grant a will. Mm -hmm. So they can nominate an executor, beneficiaries, and their will only with their passport because oh. their assets will be protected with a will. So it is not necessary to have a cedula or visa in order to draft a will. Okay, all right. A question that may be of less interest to others, I have two dogs who will come with me if I kick the bucket in Ecuador, in other words, if I die in Ecuador, can my U.S. beneficiary come to Ecuador and get them and bring them back to the U.S.? Yeah, I mean, um, there is not, under the Ecuadorian law, there is not, nothing very specific about it. Okay. What happens in the practice is you can have a friend who will be taking care of your dogs and then a family member can come and take, take your up. dogs. Because when, when you are taking the dogs outside of Ecuador, it's not like they will be asking uh, some ownership or some kind of document that prove that those dogs are, are yours. Yeah. It, Absolutely, something different will happen with, with kids, and then you have a birth certificate. Mm -hmm. But and in case of dogs, we don't have something that is clear about it. Okay. She went on to say, I'm asking particularly about whether an Ecuadorian vet, veterinarian, or someone else uh, can provide the paperwork needed for someone else to bring them back. Mm -hmm. So if she has a will and a power of attorney, is that enough? to get her dogs back and somebody else can come and get the dogs. Yeah. They don't have to have anything from a vet mm -hmm. or anything like that. I know the U.S. law is in flux, she says, and the U.S. may have some dumb ass questions, <laughs> regulations at that time. I'm just concerned that the vet may not provide the paperwork to someone. Well, it doesn't sound like she needs to worry about that. I think she's mm -hmm. going to be okay. All right, so the next question from Diana. Don, thank you once again for another informative video. I get these all the time. Uh, I, of course, have some questions. I expect to live the rest of my life in Ecuador, but I also expect to own some property, not large, maybe a hectare. Oh, that's, large that's enough. a lot. <laughs> it is. Okay. Large enough to grow food and most, mostly self-sustaining with the help of some locals. I don't want cremation or embalmed burial. Is it possible in Ecuador to have a natural green burial and can it be on one's own property? This may sound strange, but I'd rather add to the earth than to poison it. I guess an old hippie never really dies. So in other words, can you just dig a hole and throw her in and cover her up? No. Can't do that here. No, right? you cannot. Okay. <laughs> because... Um... I had plans for that for somebody I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you can do that. I know he's on, on YouTube. I can't believe I said that to a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, he's on your YouTube, like, yeah. there's no proof. Yeah. Okay, well, no, you can not do that. Yeah. Uh, there are some, some sanitary procedures okay. that they have to be followed, and also, uh, first, you will need to get a, a document from, from a doctor saying the cause of that and then it will go to the National Civil Register for the statistics. Yeah. Uh, and after that, uh, you will have to, to release the body uh, from, the, from the freeze at the hospital or anywhere. Um, you will need to have the, the, the payment for uh, home funeral services yeah. because they are the only, the only people authorized to handle remains. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, the police will get involved if mm -hmm. you do something different and it will be, become an investigation. Okay, all right. Uh, John wrote, uh, this is a good one, I should have asked this last week. I, I thought of this, but I forgot about it. Very good, Don. Please ask about death gift 
taxes? How are they handled? I mean, that could probably be a, a give us the abbreviated answer because I'm sure we could talk a long time about mm -hmm. taxes related to death and gift taxes and so forth. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to? Yeah. To, um, as a as a general answer, okay, if a person passes away and the assets are above seventy five thousand dollars then you will start paying taxes on top of that. Okay. But if it's under $75,000, you don't have to worry about paying any taxes. Okay. So it will go from $75,000, then you will start paying a, like 0.3%, something like, like a very minimum. So on that question, I will advise to get in contact so we can give in detail because you also have assets, but you also have debts. And yeah. you have to remember there's some depreciation on, on on the property, so all of that has to be taken in consideration. Yeah, that could be a really complex answer to a complex question. And I, as usual, all your information is going to be in the description. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm, I tell people when they ask me questions like mm -hmm. that, go to the source, go mm -hmm. right to the authority and get the answers from straight from Echo mm -hmm. all right? Not another YouTuber. Yeah, <laughs> you know? well, I mean, or you Facebook. provide all the information yeah. good to it. So Candace wrote, hmm, I'm actually more confused now than I was before. What if you're alone in Ecuador, like I am? The medical POA sounds as if they will just let you die if you're unconscious. If you're alone, can you have an attorney be the person they call in case of a medical emergency? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a good question. Yeah, you can, you can appoint your attorney as your medical POA. Mm -hmm. My personal advice is to build a good relationship with your attorney and have the, the trust to have your attorney in taking that decision for you. Mm -hmm. um, I, I personally, I suggest to have a friend, a close friend that, that you can speak with and you can, you can speak about this. Sure. But uh, if 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 that's not possible, then an attorney will be a good idea too. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. Yeah, that's, uh, I, I, I think about that myself. I, fortunately, I have friends here mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that I would assign, uh, you know, to, to take care of all that for me. So the last question, I think, actually we have two more questions, but one of them I had, I had to write down. Ken wrote, said, one thing not addressed. What language will the documents be in? Spanish, English, or both? I assume Spanish is required for the local legal system, but many expats wouldn't be able to confidently read them in Spanish to confirm all is exactly as desired and execute with full understanding, nor would stateside relatives. What do you think That's about that? That's a very good question because all documents, they are going to be written they're going to be drafted uh, in Spanish okay but when we have North Americans that they are not uh, Spanish speakers right it will have to be nominated a translator okay for the document so the translator will be the person who will warranty the exact translation of the document into English for the person who is going to sign. Okay. So that's the translator's job. All right. What we do here in our office is we draft the document in Spanish and we deliver an English version of the document. Okay. So our client will know in advance what exactly is going to be signed. Oh. And of course, we appoint an interpreter or translator for, for the for the signing of the document, and mm -hmm. then it, it will be covered this part. But all documents, they must be drafted in Spanish. Okay, all right. So originally they're in Spanish, but you will provide an English version of it as well. Correct. That's fake. That's fantastic. Fantastic. Fantastic, yeah. So I ran into a guy on the street this morning, and that's where this last question came from. <laughs> can <laughs> can <laughs> bank, bank CDs be included in the will? Yes. I thought we talked about that last week, but I couldn't remember for yeah. sure. So yeah. blank CDs can yeah. be included uh, in the it can be It can be included, um, but also with the banks, you have the option to nominate a, a beneficiary. Okay. Um, it has to be very well structured because 
if it's your relatives, you don't have to do anything else. You just like right. write the, the city number in your will. But if it's a friend, then you have to keep the accountant because you only have, and I hope that I, I'm not confusing anyone with this, but you have only 25% of free disposal that you can use for, you can give it away to mm -hmm. anyone else, but only 25% of your assets. Mm -hmm. So let's say you have a $10,000 CD, that means that your total assets, it must be $40,000. Okay. So you in your will, you will have to say, I have $40,000 and you will read a real estate in, in the US or, or any, anywhere else. So that will secure that that $10,000 CD, it will go to your friend, mm -hmm. or any, any person, without any questions from the, from the government okay. in Ecuador. All right, okay. Yeah, that's a, that's, I get that a lot. Mm -hmm. And I get emails from people and asking questions like that, especially related to bank. And I always tell them, go mm -hmm. talk to the bank, go talk to an attorney. Yes. There are people here that can answer those questions. Mm -hmm. And not not on Facebook or yeah no YouTube. no because yeah. um, once I mean th there's nothing that you can do once you pass away yeah and this is something that it can be taken care in advance so you will avoid a, a major headache okay mm -hmm. All right. okay what are we going to cover next time. Well, next time, uh, we're going to be talking about the different type of visas okay. and the requirements for each of them. Okay. Um, this is very, very, very common right now because the winter season is coming and we have a lot of inquiries lately from people seeking for information yeah. coming to Ecuador and start their lives here good, in, in, good. in our good. country. Okay. All right, so as usual, I'm going to put all your information in the description. Mm -hmm. I tell people, call, call or write, you mm -hmm. know, don't, don't ask me, ask the authorities, you mm -hmm. know. And, you know, hopefully people will listen to that and mm -hmm. get the right answers and so forth. So I appreciate your time. Next week, well, go ahead and sign off on that. Thank you so much. Perfect.